Okay, so this is unit nine, blood and dis lymphatic disorders. So we will be looking at uh, the pathophysiological concepts uh, and some of the uh, common things, problems associated with hematological disorders, some of the common hematological disorders. So uh, as a bit of a review, blood is the transport system for what for oxygen, glucose, nutrients, hormones, electrolytes, waste, um, uh, protection, all of that stuff. Uh, this is a picture of a blood smear. You can see all the red blood cells which transport uh, oxygen and to a lesser extent carbon dioxide. Uh, you can see some white blood cells. These ones here are um, are neutrophils, that one there is a basophil. Um, I don't see any platelets in this particular smear or any other white blood cells. It doesn't really matter. Um, so there, it's involved with um, preventing infection, preventing you know blood clotting, hemostasis, um, moving nutrients around, um, and. Really, it's involved with communication via hormones because it moves hormones around. So, coordinating homeostasis, that's that kind of thing. Again, review uh, formed elements are about 45 percent, the plasma is about 55 percent. The formed elements, which are really cell like structures, are the white blood cells, the uh, which are the leukocytes, the erythrocytes, which are the red blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are the platelets. The leukocytes are the granulocytes, and granulocytes have the word fill in them, so neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil. Um, the agranulocytes are the lymphocytes and monocytes, and the monocytes become uh, macrophages, and they're involved in phagocytosis. All of these things are involved with um, protecting the body. Erythrocytes are for transport of oxygen and somewhat carbon dioxide. Thrombocytes are hemostasis and blood clotting. Of the plasma, most of it is water. Uh, there are proteins. There are three major proteins. Albumin, which controls osmosis. Globulins, which are antibodies. And fibrinogen, which is involved with blood clotting. Fibrinogen will become fibrin. Um, and then other things are in the plasma. It dissolves like the amino acids, carbohydrates, vitamins, hormones, waste products, all of that kind of stuff is just found dissolved in the blood plasma. Hematopoiesis is forming new blood cells. Uh, so they started this, the stem cells. Um, when you, before you have bones and bone marrow, it happens in the liver and spleen, but after you, uh, you're born, it's formed in the bone marrow. The stem cells give rise to all of the, uh, the formed elements. So platelets come from the same stem cells as erythrocytes, as different as they seem, all the leukocytes as well. Um, I will post videos on Blackboard uh, from anatomy physiology courses uh, going over this if you want to review uh, I will make that stuff available I don't want to spend a lot of time in this video doing it okay here are some of the um, terms that we use when describing uh, hematological disorders uh, and they have some specific meanings so um, on the skin, there can be these these signs. Um, so the, one of them is called petechia. Petechia are non-blanching red spots. Sometimes they're purple. It's caused by a, by a broken capillary, by hemorrhage within the skin or the mucous membranes. Um, they um, it can happen when when the outflow of a capillary bed is blocked, sometimes by uh, some sort of a stricture, sometimes by scar tissue, sometimes by 
just even tight clothing can do it. Um, so they're flat, they don't raise up, and they're just a, a pinpoint. Um, and when, by non-blanching, a, a red spot that blanches is you put pressure on it and you take your finger away, it's white, and then it becomes red again. That's blanching. These things just stay red all the time. Um, again, I will post uh, a video with some pictures of this. Perperla is um, a large petechia. It's really um, like a kind of a purple. It looks rather bruisey. Um, they can be really itchy, and if they're big enough, they can cause joint pain, and I, it says here abdominal pain, but I know it more for joint pain when it's over a joint. Um, a bruise is actually an ecchymosis, uh, and so this is you're bleeding out into the tissue so that the interstitial fluid gets replaced with blood. Um, it's a typical bruise. It's flat and it's just, it's not an excessive amount of uh, fluid, it just goes into that interstitial space. It becomes a hematoma if the blood actually starts to swell the tissue in a localized space. So this is a blood blister. Um, or um, you, we, we'll get hematomas kind of in subdurally and extradurally in the in, inside the skull. Um, this is really, it means blood tumor. So this is, um, this is a space taking lesion as opposed to uh, a bruise and ecchymosis. Hemiarthrosis is when the bleeding happens uh, at the synovial membrane of a synovial joint and the joint cavity fills with, with blood. Uh, just as simple as that. So, telangiectasia is spider veins. It is um, dilation of capillaries uh, that makes that spidery uh, mark. Uh, it happens, um, you see it sometimes on people with high blood pressure on their noses, on their faces, and their cheeks, that kind of thing, uh, on lips. Sometimes fingers and toes will look at it. And, and what it is, is a dilation of the capillary itself, and so more blood is visible in it. Um, but the capillary isn't bleeding, although it bleeds easier than other capillaries. Um, so uh, this is usually from chronic local blood pressure, but it can be systemic blood pressure issues as well. Melina is when you're bleeding into your digestive system and the blood that colors the, um, the feces black. Um, and that's because you don't actually digest the blood and the, but the GI secretions interact with the blood. And so the, the stools come out tarry black and it, it indicates um, a bleed some distance away from the anus. Um, if there is red blood in the stools, it's probably a lesion in the sigmoid colon, maybe the descending colon, or the rectum itself. It tends to be on the surface. Uh, this is more tarry black, um, and it's mixed in, the, the whole stool is is this and it can indicate like maybe a, a gastric ulcer it can be as far away as the stomach or a bleed in the duodenum or um, the jejunum maybe the ileum even um, 
And so we'll see this as a symptom of various intestinal things rather than blood things. Hematuria is blood in the urine. Hema, blood, urea, blood in urine. Um, epitaxis, ep epistaxis uh, is blood in nasal drainage. So this is a bleeding nose. Um, Hemotysis is uh, blood in, in sputum, so you're, you're coughing up blood. So if somebody is coughing and holds a, like a Kleenex up to their mouth and the Kleenex comes away bloody, um, that's what this is. Menorrhagia is uh, excessive menstrual bleeding. So basically it's a, like a hemorrhage except menstrual. Rhea means excessive flow. So seborrhea is an excessive flow of sebum on the skin. Hemorrhage is an excessive flow of blood. Menorrhea, uh, excessive flow. Diarrhea, an uh, excessive flow of that which you part with, that passes through you, uh, i.e. poop. Some of the blood tests that we see is usually blood counts when you go for uh, blood work you're going to get a complete blood count, platelet count. Uh, you probably won't get a peripheral blood smear or bleeding time, but you'll see these in the hospital. Um, prothrombin time looks at uh, how quickly uh, prothrombin turns into thrombin, which starts the clotting process. Um, international normalized ratios, uh, Thromboplastin time, which is again, these are all clotting times, thrombin time. Uh, all of these things are, are looking at how quickly blood clots. Most of your patients will be just uh, blood work, blood count, and blood components. Um, okay, so we're going to look at first at anemia. So Anemia, A is negative, emia is blood, so anemia, lack of blood, is what the word literally means. And now, it can happen because of you're not making hemoglobin, so it can be uh, a problem of the production of red blood cells uh, in the bone marrow, and or not enough hemoglobin. So people could be deficient in proteins and, and, and don't have the, the building blocks to make hemoglobin. Um, can be a decrease in the red blood cells themselves. Um, both of these things lead to uh, hypoxia, low ability to carry oxygen. Um, it's usually a combination of these, uh, these things. So uh, if you have a decrease of red blood cells or, or hemoglobin or both, it's anemic. This leads to low oxygen carrying, which then leads to hip hypoxia of the tissues in general. Uh, that can lead to ischemia, which then means that there's not enough ATP made and you get claudication. Uh, so we're going to hear about intermittent claudication and that kind of thing. We're going to hear about uh, heart problems, heart ischemic problems, etc. cetera. Um, we're going to shunt blood away from the not so critical areas. So then that really is the skin. So you will end up with pallor. Like uh, if you've got a limited supply of um, blood or the limited supply of oxygen, you're going to sequester it and send it to the more vital organs, the heart, the brain, the kidneys, uh, you know, the internal organs from there. Oftentimes uh, you will um, lose your appetite because we sequester it away from your digestive system at the same time. If we have tissue hypoxia, the problem could be uh, uh, that 
there's not enough oxygen getting there. So the body increases respiratory rate and depth. Uh, so it becomes difficult to breathe. And a lot of times people actually, this is what they're complaining of. I can't catch my breath. I, you know, I feel like there's a, an elephant sitting on my chest and I can't breathe. Um, and, but it's really because of hypoxia and it doesn't matter how much oxygen you bring in if all the red blood cells are saturated and there's not enough red blood cells you are still going to feel like you're not getting enough breath um, so central nervous system will will start to depress uh, because it uses so much ATP and need and it's all aerobic respiration um, you can't have anaerobic respiration in the central nervous system. So you will get fainting or lethargy, tiredness, you will uh, slow thinking, um, maybe dizziness. Um, the liver will will try and compensate a little bit and you can end up with, with in prolonged hypoxia, you can end up with fatty liver from that. So, uh, with the hypoxia, you're going to have compensatory things. So you're going to have lots of cardiovascular. You're going to dilate your capillaries to try and transfer as much oxygen as possible, uh, both in the lungs and at the tissue. You're going to have increased heart rate that's going to try and increase um, cardiac output. You're going to have increased stroke volume, so your heart's going to squeeze harder with each, with each beat. Uh, so then, Blood's going to be moving too fast, and we call that hyperdynamic circulation, but that high cardiac output, and that can lead to arrhythmias and murmurs and things in the heart. Um, it'll also lead to ex excess of ex extracellular fluid because there is more because there's more blood getting to areas, and that will end up with more fluid in those areas. Um, we are going to uh, increase some of the chemicals that help oxygen unload from the cells so that I, we're going to release more oxygen than we normally would uh, so we don't retain it in the venous side. Um, we're going to increase erythropoiesis uh, because we want to make more red blood cells. So that's so more erythropoietin will be released by the kidneys to stimulate the bone marrow to make more um, uh, more red blood cells. This the heart working harder for increased right heart rate and increased stroke volume in that is going to mean the heart demands more oxygen, which is going to be kind of counterproductive and can lead to angina. Um, it's just something that you have to be aware of. So this is an interesting um, chart. So if somebody is exsanguinating, if they're bleeding after a, a trauma, an accident, these are the things that you're going to see um, because you're going to have blood loss. You might have increased destruction of blood, so people with sickle cell anemia and things like that will you will have very much the same sort of symptoms, um, and it all comes down to this hypoxia. So oftentimes, people with with respiratory problems will also present with the same thing, and so respiratory problems and heart problems kind of go and circulatory problems go hand in hand oftentimes with people there's an awful lot of people with lung problems copd and, and such that end up with cardiovascular problems that are all part of the compensations for it they're very intimately interrelated okay so we can have different types of anemias so um we can have red blood cells that uh, are not made properly. Uh, we can have uh, missing components. So iron deficiency anemia is simply that. We need iron to make hemoglobin. If we don't have enough iron, we don't make enough hemoglobin, and we will end up with an anemia. The, 
the obvious solution is more iron. Um, a lot of times people uh, really feel, well, I've got anemia, I better take more iron. Well, that only works if there's a, if iron deficiency is the issue. You know, taking geritol and iron supplements doesn't necessarily help if the problem is pernicious anemia. And pernicious anemia is uh, a lack of vitamin B12, usually, uh, and that happens because of intrinsic factor in the stomach and not absorbing B12. Uh, and, um, and so the, the red blood cells aren't formed properly. Aplastic anemia happens um, where you're just not forming them because, uh, because of a problem with erythropoiesis, with a problem of the, um, the blood cells actually um, forming in the bone marrow. Some of the causes of aplastic anemia could be um, autoimmune disorders or viral infections that affect the stem cells in the, in the bone marrow and, uh, and, and it gets in the way um, of forming more red blood cells. Sometimes pregnancy might uh, do it and your immune system uh, gets involved so it becomes an autoimmune. Oftentimes, toxic chemicals, especially insecticides and pesticides um, and solvents. Uh, it used to be a problem with people who worked um, like painting cars and that kind of thing that used a lot of industrial solvents would often fall prey to aplastic anemia. Chemotherapy and radiation uh, will attack the bone marrow because they attack, as we've learned, uh, the um, any cell that's actively undergoing mitosis, and stem cells are doing that all the time. Um, so it can damage the stem cells, and then they don't develop. So um, yeah, so those things kind of all go together. Aplastic anemia can be a very, very serious, life-threatening thing. Um, thalassemia is a genetic disorder. Um, it's often seen in people of Mediterranean origin for some reason. Um, and it is a genetic disorder where insufficient hemoglobin is made in each of the red blood cells. So it's a lack of hemoglobin hemoglobin. Um, it can uh, the, the red blood cells don't last as long as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it's an inherited disorder. Another inherited disorder is the sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia is uh, when the proteins that give the um, the biconcave shape of the red blood cell are not quite right and the cells can spontaneously turn into these little crescent moon shape cells and the problem with that is then they tangle and they can uh, they don't flow as smoothly um, so sickle cell anemia can can cause severe problems. Interestingly enough, and it's a recessive genetic disorder, and it's found mostly in um, sub-Saharan black populations. Uh, not exclusively, but that's, you know, that seems to be where the, um, where the recessive gene originated, at least. Now, what's interesting, people that are heterozygous with this recessive gene it seemed to have some measure of protection against malaria. Uh, so it is actually kind of um, advantageous for that gene to be around. Uh, it's not so advantageous when it's a double recessive disorder.
Polycythemia is an interesting disorder, and you would think that it shouldn't be in the anemia category, because what it is, poly, many, scythe, cell, emia, so too many cells. It's too many red blood cells are being produced by the bone marrow. And the problem with this is that the blood becomes too thick and too viscous and it's too hard to push through the capillaries. So it, it acts like an anemia because the blood transport is diminished by the increased viscosity of the, the blood. Now polycythemia can be caused by a couple of things. Um, chronic hypoxia could be one. So sometimes people with with chronic breathing issues like bad COPD, emphysema, that kind of thing, will end up with a polycythemia because the lack of oxygen causes the the production of more red blood cells and, and so they can kind of get a double whammy from that. Um, people that live at elevation uh, can, you know, if you live in the Himalayas, you, it, maybe people will be prone to polycythemia. Um, people um, that have tumors, and as we learned in the neoplasm, the, the paraneoplastic syndromes, a tumor can be releasing um, erythropo excuse me, erythropoietin, and if an excessive amount of erythropoietin will cause uh, polycythemia. Most of the time, it is actually controlled simply by phlebotomy, by, by taking blood away. Uh, you've got too many red blood cells, let's take a whole bunch of the blood away. And so regular um, bloodletting or blood donation uh, is the way out of it. I have a patient who gives blood regularly because she has polycythemia um, and it seems to be linked to uh, a breathing issue. Um, and it really is, does fit in with the um, anemic category, even though it seems that it should be the um, the the um, opposite. Now there are some people that have polycythemia as a primary disorder. They don't have other disorders and uh, this is got to be a problem within the the bone marrow itself and, and excessive amounts of red blood cells are just made. It's like an overreaction to the stimulus of uh, erythropoietin. Again, it it's all treated the same way by bloodletting, phlebotomy. Hemolytic disease of the newborn is an, another interesting thing. We see it um, oftentimes. So one of the things that you have to realize is that when the, when the baby is in the uterus, when um, the fetus is still in the womb, the fetus gets its oxygen from the placenta. And placenta is very, and generally there's not as enough or not as much oxygen comes across the placenta as will come from breathing. And so there's probably a certain amount of hypoxia uh, that, and the fetus is using a lot of oxygen because it's, it's growing. So quite a bit of red blood cell is made um, to compensate for, for that. But as soon as the baby is born, um, then the oxygen is coming from the lungs. And there's plenty of oxygen there. So the problem is now there are more red blood cells than are necessary to, um, to carry the, uh, the oxygen. Like you, you, you almost have a little bit of a polycythemia situation going on. And so what happens is the body just removes those red blood cells. Um, and that's hemolytic to break up blood. Um, now, 
a certain amount of this is normal. If it becomes excessive, then the, the byproducts uh, start to add up and it will become a hemolytic disease. Uh, jaundice will be a big thing of it. So all the anemias really lead to the same sort of thing. Um, pallor, because we don't waste blood going to the skin. Uh, dyspnea, difficulty breathing, because your, your brain is telling your body you need more oxygen, so you need to breathe more, even though you're breathing maximally. So it's a difficult breathing. Tachycardia, because you are going to be trying to push the blood that you have through the system, through the circuit as quickly as possible, and get it back to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. Um, and fatigue, because you just literally aren't making the ATP that you need um, because you don't have the oxygen to, to undergo Krebs cycle enough. So those are the four major signs, pallor, dyspnea, tachycardia, and fatigue. Again, this is um, it's a slide that saying reduced reduction in oxygen carrying capacity, uh, and we have compensatory mechanisms. So we increase the heart rate, increase the cardiac output, increase the circulatory rate, and change the flow to the various organs. Increase it to the vital organs, decrease it to the skin and, and digestive system. Um, we increase BPG uh, so that uh, it, the erythrocytes don't hang on to the hemoglobin as much for internal uh, respiration, for oxygen leaving the blood and entering the tissues. Um, so BPG is, enhances that, so we increase the amount of BPG. So any oxygen that's delivered to the area actually gets off at the area. Um, so mild anemia, we have minimal symptoms. Um, it's hard to tell the difference between cardiovascular and pulmonary disease symptoms, uh, especially in the elderly, and there's usually comorbidities and that kind of thing. Um, if it becomes moderate to severe, we end up with things like orthostatic hypotension. So that's when you stand up and feel dizzy because uh, blood has pooled and, and, and when you stand up, uh, blood pressure drops suddenly. Pallor uh, is what we've talked about. Tachypenia is, is increased breathe, breathing rates. Um, you can feel lightheaded. You can feel headachey. Again, um, you are trying to send more blood to your brain because it's a vital organ. And so therefore the brain will oftentimes just start to swell from the extra fluid and will, you'll find it's a pressure headache. Uh, the heart will not be getting enough, be working overtime and not getting enough oxygen. So you can, it can lead to angina and maybe even heart failure, the inability for the heart to pump at the required level. Um, leg cramps can happen, uh, again, because we're not, sending, um, we're not sending enough blood to those skeletal muscles. Uh, we, tend, we tend to do that as we're using the muscles, especially the postural muscles of the legs, in bed at night, when you're not using them, then you uh, constrict the blood vessels going there to try and conserve blood, and we can end up with claudication, cramping um, in in the legs. Um, as the brain uh, st tries to conserve, if it's becoming severe anemia, the brain tries to conserve um, and uh, and some of the less vital functions don't get enough. So you end up with uh, ringing in the ears from it. Sometimes we'll end up in acidosis situations from this as well. Um, 
And then generally you have a fatigue and weakness because you're not making ATP. We're going to ignore the group work thing. Look at some of these um, in detail. As you can guess, anemia is a common thing and it's something that we are, um, you're going to see a lot in practice. Iron deficiency is probably uh, one of the more common things. Um, it could be really mild, it could, it could go all the way to severe. Um, the um, So the lack of iron means that a lack of hemoglobin. So because of that, um, the cells get smaller, so they're microcytic, they, they are not as red. Um, they, um, the amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell goes down. Um, all of these things can be measured. Now, uh, the etiology of this can be chronic blood loss, um, like maybe a bleeding ulcer, uh, something like that. Uh, increased menstrual flows can lead to iron deficiency anemias. Um, malabsorption syndromes, duodenal absorption, it gets impaired. Um, people with liver disease, um, because liver is where the iron is stored, and, and so we can end up with liver disease that, that do it. Um, Various infections can can do it. Um, diets, just it's plain diets low in in iron can do it. So uh, you know there's can be um, problems of of just um, nutrition. Again, a fairly common type of anemia. This is a smear of, of anemia, uh, not necessarily iron deficiency, but yeah. So the signs and symptoms of it, uh, surprisingly enough, are pallor in the skin and mucous membranes, fatigue, cold intolerance, um, irritability, um, brittle hair, ridge nails. This is all because those hair follicles and nail beds aren't getting enough oxygen. Um, menstrual irregularities, delayed healing, uh, tachycardia, heart palpitations, uh, dyspnea, syncope. These are, that's fainting and difficulty breathing. So what do you do? Iron supplements usually. Um, if there's a problem of malabsorption, then uh, giving iron intravenously um, is probably the way to do it. Just eating iron-rich foods can do it. So pernicious anemia is a problem of vitamin B12. Um, or sometimes folic acid B9. It's usually B12. B12 is absorbed um, from your food in the presence of something called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor is made by the stomach in by when the stomach is full. So people that are starving, people that are um, that don't eat enough volume of food don't make intrinsic factor. Uh, that's why if you go and to Dr. Bernstein for weight loss, you have to go for B12 shots on a regular basis because you don't make enough intrinsic factor to absorb B12, whether you take it as, as supplements or in your food. Uh, you need to get it injected because the problem is of absorption, not of the presence of B12. Um, and what happens is these cells get really big. It's called megaloblastic. Just leave it at that. So, um, 
so um, we end up with uh, we can end up with an autoimmune problem uh, that leads to atrophy of the ga gastric glands um, and so yeah they can be nutritional deficiencies um, usually it's malabsorption a lot of people with gastric bypass also can end up with this and have to go for regular B12 shots. Um, in our, in a normal Western diet, we get enough, we're exposed to enough B12. Um, so the signs and symptoms are the same basic fatigue and pallor, etc. We often get an enlarged shiny red tongue uh, and sometimes the, we get paresthesias in the extremities um, aplastic anemia like I said before is a stem cell disorder um, it, we lose hemopoietic tissue in the bone marrow um, it can be caused by as I said before, by infections, by toxins, especially solvents, um, radiation, uh, immune injury, uh, autoimmune things like that. Um, it usually comes on at middle age. It's usually so multifactorial that it's idiopathic. They don't really know what the cause is, um, but the bone marrow function goes down, you lose stem cells, and uh, you lose all the blood cells, pancytopenia. Um, so that's red, white, and platelets, and then the complications that go with that. Um, this is looking at bone marrow, and you're seeing a lot of it is just fat. Uh, it turns into yellow marrow. Um, the onset's usually insidious. You get all the pallor, weakness, dyspnea of anemia, uh, along with leukopenia, so a loss of white blood cells, and thrombocytopenia. So you won't clot as well, and you will be more prone to infection as well as having the anemia. Sickle cell anemia is... Uh, a defect of hemoglobin synthesis, the cells will sickle and then tangle with each other and cause occlusions. Uh, they won't pass through the capillaries like they should. It can cause severe anemia. Um, so a lot of, sometimes these people get stem cell transplants so that the initial cell is not, that is leading rise to uh, the red blood cells is doesn't have that genetic dis disorder in it it's somebody else's um, this is what the, the red blood cell looks like when it sickles now um, it's really just an amino acid pair changed uh, and so therefore you have the wrong protein, uh, and when the hemoglobin is deoxygenated, it, on losing the oxygen, sickles. It goes into this shape. So when it's got oxygen, they, it's the normal flexible disc. When the oxygen levels get too low, it will sickle. Uh, You'll occlude the small arterioles and that kind of thing. can cause infarctions, pain, that kind of thing. Um, but it also, these sickled cells get removed in the spleen. Uh, so you have fewer cells, right? And you can end up with jaundice because these red blood cells, one of the waste products of uh, destroying a red blood cell is uh, bilirubin, which is going to uh, come out in your pee and your poo or if it doesn't come out, it will end up uh, in your 
humors in your fluids and stain you yellow. This is what it looks like. You can clearly see the red blood cells sickling here. Um, it's a recessive gene. It's uh, primarily African. Um, you get pallor, weakness, tachycardia, dyspnea, um, <clears throat> hyperbilirubin. Um, spleen gets very enlarged because it's working over time. And you can end up with these infarctions, vascular and, uh, occlusions. Um, thalassemia is uh, similar. You get in, increased uh, hemolysis, um, so you don't have as many red blood cells. Um, so. The spleen removes them, so splenectomy can be a treatment, uh, chelation therapy, stem cell or bone marrow transplant. Um, right, so it's deficient that way. So it, like I said before, it is primarily of Mediterranean origin. Um, signs of anemia, pallor, weakness, fatigue, tachycardia, dyspnea, um, stomach and digestive system gets impaired, uh, fatigue. Uh, if it happens in children, uh, skel skel skeletal development becomes impaired. Um, this is what it looks like. You can see the odd shapes of the red blood cells. Hemolytic um, you know, can be antigens on the fetal red blood cells, not inherited by the mother. So this can be a problem. Um, this can be a severe problem if the mother is Rh negative and is making antibodies against Rh positive blood. The baby will go full term um, but during labor, the placenta will bleed into, and, and uh, maternal blood will enter the fetal circulation, and um, and can cause the antibodies to destroy the blood of the newborn. Um, usually, it's. RH. If it's ABO incompatibility, uh, it's uh, uh, it's probably more common, but it's less clinically relevant. Um, we used to call in when I was a child. We used to call it blue babies. I had a cousin that was a blue baby, uh, and had to have a complete blood transfusion uh, right when she was born. Um, there's anemia um, to the point of lips and skin becoming blue. Uh, so Rogam is given uh, to the mother if the mother is Rh negative and uh, the baby is found to be Rh positive. Usually a, a pregnant woman with Rh negative just takes Rogam just as a precaution. Polycythemia, we already talked about. Um, one of the interesting things about, about polycythemia is that you get this visual disturbances and you get itchiness. Um, blood pressure goes up because you're trying to push the, this thick blood through the, um, the tissues. You get hepatomegaly, which the, the liver gets really big, and splenomegaly because you're trying to remove these blood cells. Um, and I think we'll end this, um, this video here and we'll pick up coagulation disorders. Uh,